We live in very bizarre and strange times. And indeed, very confusing times. It becomes very difficult to know what to believe and what not to believe. And as if that is not enough, there is an even bigger problem. The situation where you have all the evidence before you, you can easily join the dots. Yeah, but what you're getting, the picture that is emerging, you don't want to believe. I will give you a personal example. Years ago, when I was in school, we read and we analyzed a book titled 1984, written by Britain, George Orwell. And I know some of you have read this classic. Now in the book, they talk about human beings, you are born with brains, which can work and think and analyze, being reduced to robots. Now, between then and now, I have come across that suggestion very many times, in conversations, in literature I read somewhere, that the human race is heading towards a situation where we'll be just robots, incapable of thinking and analyzing and making decisions on our own. And all these years, yeah, despite all these pieces of evidence, despite all this rhetoric, I have refused to believe it will happen. And then this morning, it was thrown to my face. <laughs> I overheard a very fascinating conversation. Apparently somebody had been sent to the shop here to buy something and they had failed to count their change before leaving the shop. And so when they returned the change to the person who had sent them, <laughs> it was wrong, it was not correct. There were a few hundred shillings missing. And so this angry man says, how many times have I told you to count the change before you leave the shop? Simple calculation, just count the change before you leave the shop. The response floored me, and I'm sure it will floor you. Um, I'm sorry, it was too early in the morning. I didn't want to disturb my brain. <laughs> Concrete, conclusive evidence that they are human beings who don't like to exercise their brains, even if the exercise is as simple as taking 1,000 shillings to the shop, purchasing a few items, and then calculating the correct change. Simple maths. How many people like that are out there in the world? I will confess, I don't even want to think about that. Because in this age and time, and especially now, if there are enough people like that out there in the world, we are done. Because we are going to be fed by anything and everything, and we are going to accept it as true. We are going to accept that it makes sense when it doesn't make any sense. In fact, it becomes hilarious. When, for instance, somebody tells you we are doing better than other people because our social distancing is two meters. Aren't we clever? And this is somebody who went to school. Yeah. And we know, I mean, and what they're saying is that a virus is capable of falling off a human being and then flying through the air, actually taking off, and then landing one meter away in another human being. <laughs> Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, this situation is really sad because if somebody was born, yeah, not able to think, yeah, not very smart, that is different. But if somebody is born with a functioning brain, in fact, they're very smart. They're very bright. 
and yet they refuse to use that brain, then that is beyond tragic. Now I've made that very long intro because the information I'd like us to tackle today will need you to think for yourself and not to read the comments to form an opinion. Oh yes, I know people do that. <laughs> Maybe even there are those who count the comments. Yeah, how many people think this? Okay, there are 10. How many people think this? There are 9. Oh, therefore I'll go with the 10. They must be right. What? Majabia dunia. Anyway, before we do that, I have an update on Ken Walibora. Now, I've been assured yeah, that the following information is absolutely correct by somebody who should know. Not any Tom, Dick, or Waithera. On the morning of 10th April, Ken Walibora, the professor, arrived in the CBD very early in the morning. And he parked his vehicle, a Mercedes-Benz, somewhere along Kijabe Street. Now, I haven't been to Kijabe Street for years, but I know that through the years, and especially in the early years, it was the street where you'd find all the publishers and booksellers. Even textbook center yeah, had their major outlet there. And then Walibora made his way yeah, to the Landis Road area. It is not clear how he got there, but we can speculate. Maybe a motorbike, maybe a lift from somebody, or maybe he just got onto Matatus. And his mission was to speak to a transporter, a lorry driver or something, about transporting some bulky material to Western Kenya. Yeah. The professor hailed from Bungoma County, which is in the western part of the country. And then he encountered what we call in Kenya, Chokoraz. And he was forced to run. Yeah, and in the process of running, he was not careful about how he crossed the road. And therefore he was hit by a matatu. Verdict? It was just an unfortunate accident. Now you know you can receive information that is factual. Phones can be tracked. People before they leave home, they tell others where they're going. And so everything is good. However, yeah, when you look at the story, or at least a part of the story, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there are question marks. Now, Chokoras are street urchins. Yeah, we used to call them parking boys in the old days. They can do all manner of bad things to you. Yeah, including throw human waste at you inside your car. We know all that. But if you went somewhere and encountered them during the day, and they threatened you, yeah, it is not a big deal. Especially in a place which is as crowded as Landis Road. All you do, and especially if you're a man, is that you move towards the safety yeah, of a crowd. And then if you're Kenyan, you'll tell them something like, Ninini, what is it? And that is why it is extremely difficult for anybody to believe that Chokoraz would make somebody so scared, would make somebody feel so threatened that they would be running, you know, like you're running for your life, through a place with dozens, hundreds of witnesses. And then you feel so threatened, yeah, that you have to cross the road in a hurry. That one, I. And so, what this information has done is just to deepen the mystery. Bottom line, the last bit of that information does not add up. Yeah, it raises many more questions. Yeah. And there's something else. Yeah, and this one is very sad. According to that information, this accident happened at 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So this matter comes, it hits somebody who's uh, 
identity people are not aware of. And it is common knowledge when something like this happens, you should rush that person to hospital and for medical attention as soon as possible. But that doesn't happen. Yeah. Finally, about one hour later at 10 o'clock, he's taken to Kenyatta National Hospital. And at the hospital, he receives no attention at all. And he passes on at around midnight. Aye, that is very sad. And it raises the question, how many other Kenyans pass on in this way? Because we got to hear of this one, because this was no ordinary Kenyan. What? That is so sad. Oh boy. Anyway, I'll keep on following up on this story very closely. And of course, I'll keep you posted. Now, back to what we started with. Now, I'm about to show you various clips about the ongoing crisis. And I want you to make your own conclusion. Think and make your own conclusion. I'll be back in a bit. What does all this tell you? What are you thinking? Let me give you a little more time to chew on it. And tomorrow, hopefully, I shall give you my view. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekuch.